Hello and welcome to Sound Heal Podcast. I am your host, Natalie Brown, and thank you so much for joining me as we continue to explore the fields of sound therapy, sound healing, and using sound for health and wellness. The topics within this episode have been longtime interests of mine. I remember when I was young, taking a tape recorder out on out with me when I would go on walks, hikes in nature, even just in the backyard, and just seeing what I could capture within the sounds and even begin incorporating some of those sounds into musical compositions. And along the way, especially last year in 2020, this interest in acoustic ecology and soundscapes had been re-sparked. I took, as uh, many of listeners are aware of, Dig Deeper, a great series, a sonic wisdom sound therapy series with Mitch Nur, Mike Tambura, and Thomas Orr Anderson. There are many discussions about soundscapes, deep listening, and uh, acoustic ecology. And I, so I decided to look and see if there was an acoustic ecology course that I could take. And because of the situation, the pandemic of last year, I was able to take an acoustic ecology class online through the University of Iowa and was further uh, interested and in, just got out there and do, did a lot of field work and projects through that course that I stumbled upon a, a synchronicity that the World Soundscape Project, of course, through R. Murray Schaefer and his great work, was at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver, British Columbia, and my brother happens to be a professor there. So just fun synchronicities, and our guest today, Hildegard Vesterkamp, really her influences stem from working with, studying with R. Murray Schaefer. She is a composer, a radio artist, a teacher, and sound ecologist. She's originally from Germany, where she studied flute and piano and moved to Canada in 1975. And she worked as a research associate alongside R. Murray Schaefer at the World Soundscape Project. And, of course, this work fed into Schaefer's book, very influential book, The Tuning of the World. And through Hildegard's work with Schaefer and with the radio station, she developed a deep interest and concern for noise and the acoustic environment, and this greatly influenced her style of composition as well. She began to experiment with recording, processing, and mixing environmental sounds in the recording studio. And this very influential time has led, led to her career of leading sound walks of composition. Uh, she was the editor of Soundscape Newsletter and one of the founders of the World Forum for Acoustic Ecology. We have a wonderful and very reflective conversation about her background, about the influences and how she was impacted about her time working with R. Murray Schaefer about her compositions, how she uses and processes and interprets sounds. Also about sound walking, how sound walking develops. And also, and I think really importantly, we see so many connections between the field of acoustic ecology and also sound therapy, that truly sound wellness, the wellness of our sonic environment and how it affects our wellness is extremely connected and the, the difference between listening and hearing, and also how much we can learn from the paradox of silence. Just a quick note that the first 20 minutes of the conversation with Hildegard Westerkamp, um, her audio quality is not the best, but we're able to fix that about 20 minutes in, and it will be uh, much better, higher quality after that. This episode is sponsored by the Ohm Shop and Spa. They offer the country's largest showroom of quartz crystal singing bowls, sound healing instruments, and vibrational medicine tools. They are very helpful when you are looking to really up the level of the instruments in your collection, when you're just trying to find that perfect instrument. They can really consult with you and help you find the right one. So call them today or visit them at theomshop.com. If you're ever in Sarasota, Florida, 
do consider stopping by and visiting them or enjoying a luxury spa treatment such as sound healing, energy work, massage, vibroacoustics, or hypnotherapy. And thank you so much to the Ohm Shop for their sponsorship and support of this podcast. Please enjoy this episode with Hildegard Vesterkamp. Well, wonderful. Why don't we start with your background a bit just to to set the stage and uh, maybe tell us a bit about your background prior to your time in Vancouver and how your fascination with sound started. Okay. Um, well, I grew up in Germany and I emigrated in, uh, to, Van- to Can- Canada. Essentially, I've been in Vancouver since that time. Um, in 1968, I was 22 at that time, and um, I believe that when you have such a change in your life that uh, something gets triggered in your listening because you're so uh, in such a new environment um, that you you're the kind of curiosity about a new culture and about a new environment um, simply is deeply triggered and you're listening in new ways. You're constantly comparing between your former life and your new life. And that's what I remember doing at the time. And even for me, the immigration was a joyful experience. It was what I wanted to do. And so I wasn't uh, I wasn't a refugee. I wasn't um, in any dire straits or anything. So uh, it was a, it was a very wonderful change. So, you know, when I grew up in Germany, I grew up in in, um, in the countryside near a, a sort of medium-sized town. And um, my grandfather had a farm and uh, I was essentially kind of growing up in farmland, although my parents weren't farmers, but we, we had a house and a property in the countryside. And... Uh, uh, you know, I think that kind of upbringing when you have room to roam around as a child uh, and you play in forests and you climb trees and you, um, you you simply are in that kind of natural environment, your perception uh, gets trained in a way. Not just your listening perception, but your whole embodied perception of a place uh, gets trained to connect to that or getting trained is maybe not the right way. You just simply connect with that kind of environment and in that connecting is knowledge and that knowledge you carry with you for many years. I was not consciously aware in the sense of articulating as a child that I was listening to bird song and that I knew a lot of the names of the birds or the church bells for example, that later when I would return from Canada and would hear the church bells, I would just uh, have this incredibly um, nostalgic Mm -hmm. (laughs) listening experience because I was missing it so much. But I don't remember consciously um, listening to the bells. My father would, would... often make me aware of it. He was the kind of person who would always say, oh, look, this is beautiful. Oh, listen, 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 you know. So he would, <laughs> he would make me aware of the bells, um, which I probably was hearing very well, but I wasn't talking about it. So um, there were aspects to that environment that had a certain beauty that I carried over here with me. And, of course, when I came over here, the lack of it, um, the lack of that specific kind of soundscape becomes very apparent, and then you start comparing. But I must also say I was not a very conscious listener in the sense I didn't consider myself a listener. I was a frightened music student. Um, I studied piano and flute as a girl, and then I started to study music at the um, University Conservatory in South Germany in Freiburg, and I was completely intimidated by the the that type of education. Uh, I did have one very good piano teacher when I was a girl, and she she was a very good listener, and that was a good experience. But my overall experience with music education was not 
in the long run, not positive. It was, um, it just scared me. <laughs> so I was actually, by the time I came to Canada, I was determined never to study music again. <laughs> and then the University of British Columbia had a music program. They had a new music building with practice rooms and listening rooms and all those things, and they had no entrance exam. And I just realized I wanted to study music. What I didn't know was that I wanted to listen to music and get to know it better. I was essentially maybe wanting to be something like a musicologist, but um, that was not clear to me. I just ended up studying a sort of a general music education with instrumental classes and all that and enjoyed it hugely because it was not scary. And in that context, um, I heard a lecture of Murray Schaefer. He was a guest lecturer one day, the Canadian composer Murray Schaefer, and he spoke about contemporary music, he spoke about um, soundscape, he spoke about listening, and by the end of that lecture my ears were opened in ways that I had never consciously experienced. And that I could not forget. And it was really at that point when I became very conscious of the act of listening and very conscious of that that's really what I wanted to do. And because he proposed not just to listen to classical music or music, but to listen to our whole society, everything, including its noises, um, that was what inspired me because it meant that I could open my ears to my whole life. And um, there was something very, very liberating in that. And I, that experience I simply did not forget. And then just one phone call with Schaefer a few years later basically gave me a job at the World Soundscape Project at Simon Fraser University. Mm -hmm. And I, was, I thought I had arrived in paradise. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because it was in, among people that were listeners in that same way. And yeah, we were all musicians and composers, most of us. And so, you know, there was that knowledge in us also. But the emphasis was on uh, something's wrong in our world. We need to do something about the incredible noise that uh, our society has developed, and we need to study that. And we're going to do it with including, as a basis of our studies, including the listening to that environment. So we were not um, noise activists in, in the sort of conventional sense that we wanted to fight noise. No, we wanted to listen to it first, we wanted to record it, and we wanted to study it. And then from that information, through the listening, uh, we wanted to um, explore what changes could be made, um, how we as a society could address these issues. And um, of course, there were interest in educating people about listening, educating people as listeners, doing sound walk. Um, there was, we did noise measurements, we did all the things that people that were involved in noise studies, we tried to do as much of that or at least study it and get to know it. And we were trying to connect with scientists, we were trying to connect with urban planners, with all sorts of professions, acoustical engineers, professions that had to do with um, sound. In and, uh, you know, psychoacoustics, all those different arenas of uh, people studying sound already, but not including the act of listening into their studies. And, yeah, I mean, people had problems with this because this was in the 70s and, you know, we were trying to change the world and there was this reaction that we might be a little bit flaky, um, that we're not... Uh, rigorous enough in terms of our our scientific study, um, but we were incredibly rigorous about listening, and we were also working very hard to try to connect with the scientific profession 
and try to bridge this uh, gap between human perception and scientific study. And that was totally fascinating to me <laughs> um, because it had that social, political, um, sociological aspect to it combined with creative thinking and artistic work and uh, yeah it was also just a lot of fun working in that context yeah. of the project yeah looking back on it now it, with the project really trying to wake up people's ears and, and focus our ears to the details in the acoustic environment looking back at it now how do you think it it did impact people both in vancouver on a larger scale but also personally, how, how was that time of your life and how did it uh, influence you and, and your understanding of sound? Well, it totally shaped me. I mean, it, it basically started my career. Mm. Uh, that's that's uh, without a question. Um, that was what I was most interested in. And I'm observing over time that that's when people touched into this area, when they were touched by it, by the listening. Mm -hmm. Um, they basically could not forget it and would take it on and somehow integrate it into their own professional growth. And um, that's been uh, an interesting thing to observe. Uh, sometimes it was frustrating because we felt we couldn't establish a field of acoustic ecology or a field of soundscape studies because um, it was so um, wide-reaching. Mm -hmm. It was touching... Mm -hmm many areas, like you were saying at the beginning beforehand, you were saying that, uh, you know, the, the healing aspect of sound and listening um, is one area. Then there is the medical stuff about hearing loss, and there is the scientific things about noise measurements. You reach into everything. Um, and so to actually remain focused, our focus did remain, uh, was always the the listening and the education around that um and so my observation over the years has been that uh people who would go on a sound walk uh with with me or other people would be touched as as um intensely as i was when i first heard Schaefer uh, giving his lecture uh, because it is a kind of an ear-opening experience um, that we don't often have in daily life, where we reserve a, a space of time where we do nothing but listening, and we're not uh, interrupting that. We're just simply listening to the environment and to whatever else goes on in our own minds if we do that consciously. And that listening in itself is a profound experience because it reveals it reveals uh, aspects of the environment that we think we know. In, in, it reveals details that um, we suddenly connect with. And it's that connection that is um, very pleasurable and very inspiring. It's the inspirational part, that inspiration of noticing something uh, that really gets people. And over the years, I have observed that people will uh, continue in that vein. Um, if they are of another profession, they may eventually integrate this approach into their professional approach. Um, there's always someone in the group who will pick up strongly and will take it and run with it, as I did with my own. You know, I just took what shape is the uh, philosophy, his ideas, and ran with it all my life, because it was uh, an endlessly inspirational and um, new experience to keep learning all the time. And so over the years, even though it seems like a very, very slow process, we have observed things um, expanding. Uh, eventually, in the 90s, we uh, created the World Forum for Acoustic Ecology, which is an or international organization of affiliates that is concerned with the study of the sound environment. And this organization then uh, organized uh, 
fairly regularly, regular conferences internationally. And uh, we put out a journal called Soundscape. And um, nowadays, um, I find that the interest in sound audio listening has absolutely exploded. Uh, in the, our time of COVID, it's even more so. And I think the reason is that um, we all experience an enormous change in our soundscape when lockdown started. We suddenly came out of a very hectic, busy life to a very quiet, empty life, or what seemed empty. Streets were empty. Um, there was no busyness. There was no hectic. Um, there may have been anxiety, yes, yeah, but what our bodies, our perception uh, got from all this was we all experienced a quiet environment. And that information that we got at that point was brand new for many in the cities. And uh, people listened up. It, you couldn't avoid it. And one of the really interesting things that the first comments were, oh, there's so many more birds, or there's uh, well, I don't think there's more birds. The birds were more audible. And we were listening to them. We, we actually heard them. And we actually noticed them. And there was information in that. There, there's now, I've heard um, people talk about, uh, colleagues, for example, talk about the fact that there may be the possibility, because the birds are listening, uh, are hearing each other better in quieter urban environments, is that the breathing is much more active and that there's actually more birds now or beginning to come more birds because of that. So, you know, the animal world has also uh, been communicating better. We have reports of underwater um, acoustics where the noise is reduced as well and so communication between the, the uh, whale, for example, um, is, has been made easier, and that will bring changes. And um, biologists are beginning to study some of those things and trying to keep track of this. It's a perfect time to to try to study this, this because there has been a radical change. Um, the fact that we don't have constant air traffic over our heads um, is, is um, rather healing for most of us. And um, it is, of course, difficult for the industry, understood, right? Mm -hmm. But perceptually, um, this is the fact that we have experienced this big change, and we can learn from that. And in the uh, in 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 the world of where we have to think about climate change and we have to address it, this couldn't be better information. Mm -hmm. This is increasing the sense of urgency. And a lot of that sense of urgency that we need to really address this comes from that visceral experience of change in the acoustic environment. And, you know, I think there is um, an incredibly positive side to this very difficult time as a result. Yeah. I I noticed in both, you know, mainstream media in both cases for the underwater sound environment and also the birds, you know, that was being mentioned um, and talked about and just brought up quite a bit over the past year. Um, I saw yeah. both of those stories just being shared. So it's interesting. I, I think that it does take a perception change to go from hearing to listening, you know, and to really have this big shift in our lives to um, have more of an appreciation of uh, this paradox of, of silence. You know, I mean, you hear uh, people say that they're, they're scared of quiet or they need, they need to cover it up with white noise. I'm just curious your thoughts on, on that, the, the difference between hearing and listening and that space that we can create when we really do tune into the silence. 
Yes, and um, it's often the contrast between environments that will make us listen up. If we're not necessarily trained in conscious listening, uh, you know, we we kind of just accept the environment and and uh, go along with what's happening. And if there's a drastic change in it, then we'll notice it. And it's that which makes us more conscious of what's going on. And this was worldwide uh, with COVID. And so that's why that is so important and significant. Um, you know, we... we um, some people are just natural listeners and they relate to the world through listening, but many people are not. And so that then requires some learning and some education, getting, making, um, creating awareness about what's going on around us and also creating, creating awareness of what's going on inside us. Like what are the thoughts that distract us enough that we are listening to that and are preoccupied with that rather than listening to the world around us. And one of the things I like to do in the sound walks is making people aware of that dynamic of inner and outer listening and how that keeps switching as we are moving through life to become aware of what in life um, gives us, brings us enough attention that we are willing and want to listen to the world and to the people around us and what uh, occupies us so much inside ourselves that we turn inside and want to listen to that and to me to know a little bit about how that dynamic works inside each one of us is information about a balance between inner worlds and outer worlds and to me, that also is information about a kind of an ecological balance. Um, so that, you know, over the years of doing a lot of sound walks and having a bit of listening practice, that consciousness of how we turn inside and outside, to me, is vital information about what kind of a listener I am. And if we all begin to understand how we relate to the world through our listening, uh, we are more consciously connecting to the world. And I think in this highly um, dangerous time of climate change, we need to be very aware of that. What is our relationship to the environment? And is it interesting? Is the natural environment interesting enough to us and do we know enough about it that we want to save it? Many urban people are simply not connected to nature on the level that, say, someone would be from a remote community where nature is just always present, uh, where the pace of nature and the changes of nature are uh, simply... Uh, experienced physically and perceptually and that is knowledge that is very important and um, I think our indigenous communities have that knowledge carry that knowledge inside themselves still despite all of the attempts to destroy that that knowledge is still in many of them and I think this is very important knowledge that we need to honor and that we need to acquire ourselves it's so easy to just shut all that out when you're in the city and um yeah uh why like i think you were mentioning something about white noise mm -hmm. yeah um in in the city we are we're always surrounded by some sort of hum whether it's the traffic or the air conditioning from buildings or any kind of machine noise and Schaefer has a term for that kind of broadband sound that surrounds us. He calls it a sound wall. And it's a good image because what it does, it doesn't allow us to listen beyond that wall. We don't hear distance. We hear only that. And um, it doesn't, our ears are not allowed to reach further and hear the more subtle, quieter sounds. 
So when that sound wall was removed at the beginning of COVID, we suddenly heard our neighborhoods in very different ways because there was no traffic interfering with that. And we heard the birds, but we also heard each other's voices. Um, people were encouraged um, and enlivened by, by you know, making those wonderful daily noises for the health workers, um, the, the singing and the pot banging. And so there was pleasure in that because we could hear each other as a community supporting the health uh, workers in hospitals and care homes and all that. And there was an interesting new balance between the noise of celebration, of celebrating this, this, these people that are helping everyone, and at the same time connecting to the sort of human nature aspects of our neighborhoods for the first time in a long time. Yeah, that's really a perfect example of sound wellness, that uh, the wellness of our environment, our sonic environment, but also how it affects our wellness, you know, the inner and the outer, the, the global and the, the individual. Yeah. You know, I'm curious, you've mentioned sound walks a couple times. How did that sound walking uh, process develop? And, and for those that haven't experienced it, could you describe what a sound walk is like? Sure. Um, well, Murray Schaefer was basically the one who invented it and invented the term. And when I started to work with the World Soundscape Project, I was quite enthusiastic about the idea and kind of took it on. And uh, in the early days, uh, we would do kind of simple uh, things where we would uh, explore a route and then make a map of that route and then... Um, ask questions. Um, so we would print out the, the map uh, as a guide for, for people, and then we would, at certain points, have listening points and would ask questions about what was heard there or make them aware of specific things. So that kind of walk could be done individually, easily, and we used it in workshops. And then afterwards, we would have discussions about that experience. Um, over the years, a sound walk basically is a, a very simple thing. It's an opportunity to go out and listen to everything in the environment. That's all it is. And you can create any kind of structure for it. Um, here in Vancouver, we have, since 2003, um, we have a public sound walk four times a year as part of Vancouver New Music uh, as part of their concert season and they offer it as a kind of a community event for free and um, they approached me and I said I would like love to do that and then eventually over the years a, a group of usually young people developed is now called the Vancouver Soundwalk Collective who are offering these walks um, in, two in the spring and two in the fall and sometimes some extra ones um, for if there's like a festival or something and um, and many of these young people are also offering them now in other aspects of their lives, like whether it's at schools or whatever they are doing. So it's kind of spread as something. The, the kind of very simple basic structure for these walks, for the public walks, is um, a one-hour walk in silence as a group and then a discussion afterwards. And that discussion can last anywhere from a half an hour to an hour. So, you know, we usually say about two hours um, at the most for this kind of event. And there'll be, so what we do is we um, explore a route ahead of time and time it so that it is about an hour. And um, this exploration of finding a route, a good route, um, is actually even more interesting than the sound book itself because you really begin to explore your neighborhood or wherever you decide to do this walk and uh, you're composing something. You're composing a walk that has uh, maybe contrasting sound, uh, soundscape, contrasting sound levels, for example, quieter, louder, indoor, outdoor, um, slower walking, faster walking, um, natural, um, industrial, traffic, whatever, like, you know, um, trying to find a route where you have change in the soundscape. 
so you're doing your best to try to offer an interesting sound experience. And then the day of the sound walk comes and everything is different, <laughs> of course, right? <laughs> because you can't control the soundscape. And so, you know, the sound walk leaders have to be, uh, just keep on listening and say, it doesn't matter what, whether it's like what I explored or not, um, it will be interesting. So the sound walk leader in body language and in all behavior um, has to be very present as a listener as well, while at the same time being responsible for the group and the safety of the group. Because it's all in silence, um, you know, you want to make sure everybody feels safe. Uh, we give a little introduction, of course, and inform everybody. We also say, you know, if there is an emergency, you do talk, please. You know, you need to speak. Uh, so this is not a religious experience here. We, we're, just, we're just wanting to listen in quiet as a group. And then we arrive somewhere where it's quiet enough and, and comfortable enough where we can have this discussion. And the discussions are a very, very important part of the sound walk because it is a kind of a processing of what the experience was like. And because we were in a group, it's an opportunity to listen to each other and to compare our listening experiences. And often what gets revealed is how differently we all listen and how different our attention is. People will mention sounds that other people simply didn't hear. Um, maybe because they were at the end of the group or at the beginning, but maybe because they were also thinking about something and not listening to the outside world. And so it reveals perceptual information of how, how we naturally listen and how we differ and in which ways we also have, what do we also have in common? The really interesting thing that has never changed in all this time um, is that the groups at the end feel completely connected with each other, even though we were quiet. We didn't talk with each other for the first hour. And there's this sense of connection that we experienced something together uh, that no one else did experience. And, of course, sometimes our groups are looking weird because, you know, if we're in a place where there's other people, we will get questions like, what are you doing? Or, you know, you look like zombies. Or literally, you know, or maybe it must be a religious group, somebody said. <laughs> because, you know, <laughs> people don't look particularly alive when they walk and listen. <laughs> listen. <laughs> and um, or alive in a sort of an internal way right more like a meditation group sometimes um, and of course they're very alive because they're connecting in this way but so one of the things I've been trying to do also to make people aware that when people do talk to them and ask a question and they're nearby they should answer you know say oh we're just doing a sound walk come and join us or something like that right um, so not make it uh, an asocial <clears throat> exclusive event, but it's difficult. <laughs> um, so that's one form. But there's many people in the world who've taken up the concept of sound walk, and uh, they may be doing it with equipment. They may be recording uh, a sound walk. Uh, they may be working with a group that learns recording and listening. Uh, there may be people who might make a sh shorter sound walk or something with, we've done different formats as well, where we've included people that would, um, for instance, if there was an interesting acoustic space somewhere on the route, I've asked a musician whether they could be pretend to be a music, uh, a street musician and set themselves up and create a kind of an ambiguous experience where the sound walk participants may not know is this a performance for us is, has it been set up or is it actually uh, happening and I often like to play with that edge of you know what 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 has been set up here for the benefit of the group or and what is just happening uh, spontaneously and feels like a performance um, it's a very interesting thing to play with because 
it fits into that desire to create a sound walk where people are naturally beginning to notice things and where their ears are perked up. And so if you make it ambiguous, uh, people will listen very differently. And so we've played with things like that as well. Um, sometimes more performative aspects to it, um, sometimes none. And uh, yeah, sometimes we document the sound works just by recording them or somebody may make a, some photographs and videos discreetly. Um, so the, the form is highly flexible. It's completely up to people who want to create a sound work to um, create its format as well. There is no one way of doing it. The only, the only thing that's important is that we want to encourage a safe environment for safe listening. And, it, you know, that's kind of a key word, safety. We don't listen very well if we don't feel safe. Uh, so if we create, you know, many, ed I grew up in an educational environment, as I said earlier, with a music uh, education that did not feel safe to me. You know, I was constantly afraid of making mistakes. So you don't listen very well and you don't learn. And many school environments were like that, certainly for me um, and for people in, in uh, more author authoritarian uh, structures. Um, so the issue really becomes is how can we how can we set up a, a sound walk where people feel safe and alert at the same time uh, and and where there can be an opening to everything that that we meet orally everything that m meets us on a sound walk like that how can we stay open to it and not close off or if we close off why did we close off that we can observe those things so in some international, well, even here in Vancouver, I mean, big discussions. Can we go do a sound walk in the downtown east side, which is a, the darkest place of Vancouver where there is just huge issues with addiction and, and um, homelessness and things. And w would we want to go into a place like that as a silent group? And why or why not? So discussions like that are important. I got a question from someone in Beirut on a, in a, one of those Zoom sessions recently. Uh, how do you do a sound walk in, in a place like Beirut where there's just been a huge explosion? Um, is that possible? Should one do it? Or if one wants to learn more listening, how can one set that up in environments where there's crises and, and uh, yeah, just very difficult political situations and, and so on. So, you know, you want to be very careful about how you set something up like that. But it, it what, what I'm, the reason I'm saying it is it addresses the issue of listening. When, when, when can we listen openly to everything around us and why? And when can we not? And, uh, if we don't feel safe, we can't open up. Right. Right. Yeah. You know, and I, I really do like that aspect of uh, just not knowing what to expect and ambiguity. It, it almost is just such a great wa way to get to know your environment, get to know your community. It, you know, it's a different aspect of learning where you are and it's going to be different every time that you do it. So, Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and it's, it's yeah. you know, that kind of noticing carries always inspiration in it. Yeah. And people feel better, feel better afterwards. They may have new ideas. They might uh, suddenly come up with making changes or, you know, wanting to change their own sound environment or um, anything like that. And this connection between noticing something is kind of an embodied noticing and uh, and then being inspired about your life that is what happens almost every time when we do a sound walk it's just i've experienced that i cannot i cannot think of a sound walk where people wa walked away bored um you know there were some there were some sound some um i remember some sound walks where 
the the sound environment itself was a little bit problematical and if you're not uh if if you're not really used to listening and you have to work a little bit at figuring out what this is all about then it can be discouraging perhaps mm -hmm. so we've had that and you know sometimes people walk away which is fine um, but I've also experienced people coming, <laughs> very interesting, I remember one sound walk in Brussels, <laughs> um, there were two people who came, absolutely critical, right from the start, <laughs> and they started talking while we were walking, and you know, they were just completely disruptive, and luckily, and, and it actually burdened the sound walk in a way that was very interesting, and um, I was luckily experienced enough to just let it happen and not get uptight about it. And then they eventually got bored and walked away. Uh, but the discussion afterwards was highly informative about yeah. what that did to our listening and to our connection to the environment. Um, there was no willingness to listen. And when you, when you have that situation of someone being part of a group not willing to listen, to really listen what's going on, then we have a problem, mm. as we know. <laughs> we have had that very ex experience with the United States right now, right? Yeah. Or in many yeah. other aspects. So. Yeah, yeah, I think that, I don't know, there's something about our society that perhaps we're much more visual that some people, when it comes to just listening, um, there, there's there's a block there or, or something yeah that's really interesting yeah there's a block and there's a lack of training it, it's a, it's um, not a priority in our education system even though it is so much based on listening schools and universities you do have to do a lot of listening but it is a kind of listening that is uh, I don't think necessarily safe because it's connected with grades and with good perf good or bad performance it's it's uh, still has that aspect of danger in it even though it's milder than what what many of us experienced in the earlier years but uh, I mean <laughs> just when I, when I think about just listening to politicians having debates in in parliament or whatever I mean it is it is absolutely horrendous to witness the non-listening that goes on there. It's all defensive speaking, right? right. And so, right. Um, yeah, the visual, the visual um, being a sort of a main, um, everything in our world encourages us to be visual when we look at all the screens and the computers, it shows it all, right? Uh, so we we actually forced in our work to be very very visual and and ignore the listening sense. That's why I think there is such a demand or such a desire now for listening in order to balance that. Uh, people, there have been enough people in the world now who have experienced the healing aspects of simply listening, and um, I think it's. It's a natural balancing act that there's so many more people now wanting to connect to their listening and wanting to connect to the world through the ear. Um, and uh, because there's this overuse of, of our eyes and our minds, um, we're sitting too much, we're not moving enough. So, you know, the connection with walking and listening is a very good antidote to sitting at the computer and seeing all the time yeah yeah and I'd, I'd love to just talk briefly at least about um, your own compositions and uh, the music that you create I and I think what's really interesting is something you mentioned right off the bat was your c different cultural exposure you know when you were growing up in the country and then and then coming to Vancouver and kind of the different cultural exposures when you've you've traveled to record different sonic experiences and one of your projects that really interests me is that um, the project in an in installation in New Delhi uh, uh, called Nada I, I just wondered if you would talk a little bit about that particular uh, creation and and what that was and how it came together sure um, yeah India was uh, another aha moment for me um, when I was invited by the German Goethe Institute in New Delhi 
uh, to give a soundscape workshop at the beginning of the 90s. Um, I had never been in India, and I had actually never been in a uh, other than North American European culture, and it just knocked me sideways. <laughs> it, it was incredible, the intensity um, that met me there, and um, I was literally thrown into this culture, you know, flying into New Delhi at four o'clock in the morning, and then two days later, with huge jet lag, 12, 12 and a half hours time difference between Vancouver and Delhi. Mm -hmm. um, and then two days later, having to start this soundscape workshop, um, it was like being thrown into the water, basically. And I immediately, you are, um, you are, uh, yeah, yeah, you could say assaulted, even though I didn't, it was not a negative experience. You were just right. assaulted with this overload of sound, of very different soundscape. Uh, the first one was waking up in the morning and hearing nothing but f uh, fog, um, uh, car horns and truck horns. And I kept thinking, why, why is everybody honking so much? <laughs> and eventually I understood why, because it was not so much an aggressive honking getting out of the way honking, it was more an informational honking saying, I'm right here beside you, behind me, don't move. <laughs> it was a communication, right? I mean, there's a mix of it, of course, there's both of it, but um, the traffic is so dense there, and this was in the 90s, in the beginning 90s, so it was a slightly different kind of traffic but it was still incredibly dense and older cars and all that and uh, including also of course animals cows and uh, camels and elephants in in the mix and horses um, so and and wagons and all sorts of vehicles that would be in that traffic so you know basically you feel thrown into this what seems like an incredible chaos and then I had the opportunity to work with a group of people for three weeks to explore the soundscape of Delhi. And I had a recorder with me and I recorded everything because especially the, the participants very much wanted me to record all this. Um, they didn't have any equipment and so they were very interested in hearing uh, what we had just done during the day, listening back over speakers to this experience, which brings you new consciousness too. What does the microphone pick up? What do we hear? So we did that for three weeks, and um, in that group of people were two young architect students. And uh, one uh, a lady who was a bit older than I was, and... Um, I, I returned to Delhi two or three times after that um, for more workshops, and the three of us became very close in that time. And this idea came up to from the from the two architect students um, to create this humongous sound installation. And um, we were lucky enough and through the help of Max Müller Bavan, which was the German Goethe Institute, um, to get access to a building in the Indira Gandhi National Center for the Arts, which is a very big park, um, is a building that made is made of the mud of that land, um, the Matigar it's called. And um, it's a large circular building with rooms and corridors and has these interesting acoustics and these two architect students by that time they had finished actually um, and they converted this building uh, acoustically with various things uh, um, and created a route uh, for visitors to walk through and their idea was and this was all their idea and I was basically the composer for that idea and Vina the uh, other person was the person who did, who advised mostly on the sacred aspects of the installation. So their idea was to come from the outside, from noise, through human soundscapes, through natural soundscapes, to through sacred soundscapes. So we had four basic themes that the 
visitors would walk through. And the uh, Mona and Raj, who were the architect students, created large panels with information about noise, about human soundscapes, human, human sound making voices, physical sounds, uh, natural soundscapes, and then the sacred. And in India, the sacred is very, very important. And everybody ended up in this ra round room um, for which I had created a kind of a soundscape made up of many of the sacred sounds in India, the temple bells and the om chanting and um, uh, and, and not just Hindu, but, you know, um, uh, gurdwaras and mosques and, and all those. I had recorded a lot of that. And the noisy soundscape was outside. They had made a walkway where there were speakers along the walkway. And basically what people heard was where they just came from, the city of Delhi. <laughs> so they walked through this channel of New Delhi soundscape, and but amplified, and also with information about noise, with decibel scales and uh, little plaques that said... Um, uh, what are you hearing in your right ear? Uh, what was the first uh, sound this morning? I can't remember which one it was. Or have you heard? Have you heard? How many birds have you heard? It's questions like that. Mm -hmm. So then they would walk towards the building, and then they would come into a space that would then all be about human soundscapes. And these were all sounds also from India. Everything was from India. Everything that I had recorded was put into those. Um, pieces and each and then the next one was the nature and then the sacred and and each one of these um, pieces that I created were about half an hour long and they just ran all day and the interesting thing was that you could hear a little bit of overlap between the spaces in in inside once you were inside the building um, so there was a bit of transparency acoustic transparency between these different spaces, and so the the they were they were basically guided through it like as if on a sound walk. They walked through this, and um, this was something very unusual for Delhi. It had never really been done, and was very people had lots of questions. And uh, in the opening of the installation, we had this big, beautiful ritualistic kind of opening in the park. Uh, people came up to me right after and before they were going to go into the building and wanted to know about the installation. <laughs> and I said, um, I'm not going to tell you anything. Y you have to, this is for you to explore. And if you have any questions afterwards, please come and see me. <laughs> and they were quite miffed by that, some of them. <laughs> they just could not... Indians, Indian people are very, very intense and very curious. And I just, you know, <laughs> I was just um, kind of thinking, no, you've got to listen first before I tell you anything. I mean, I had told them a little bit in the opening. We had, all of us. And uh, so then what happened was that some people came back to me and said, oh, I get it. I'm going to go through it again. <laughs> So, and and most people could not, um, the, the main response was that they could not relate to the first, to the first two at least, or even three spaces very well. They didn't know, like, what is this? Why am I listening to all this? And the, yeah, there was visual information and they had all that too, but they were puzzled. And then they came to the sacred space where there was some opportunity to sit down and maybe participate with the om chanting and so then it suddenly all became clear from i mean that is from people who you know gave feedback and came and told me about it afterwards that sacred space then gave them an opportunity to settle into the space very familiar to them with the sounds and whether they wanted or not, it allowed them to reflect on what they had just experienced. And this big recognition of, oh, what are we missing 
because of noise in urban environments. What are we not experiencing? And um, I think that insulation had quite a big impa impact on quite a few people as a result uh, because it, it had that underlying message. But you could only get it if you did it, if you actually went through it, right? And it's the same with sound walks. You can't talk about sound walks and know anything. You've actually yeah. got to do it. And once you've done it, you, you get it. Is it. Is there a part of that installation that can be found online? I mean, I, I know that wasn't, it wouldn't be the same experience, but I think on your website you have a portion of that. Yes, I have um, sort of a, it, it's also a bit of a journey, mm. taking people through the, um, I think I posted all the the posters or all the visual information on there, and uh, there's an opportunity then to listen to excerpts of those different stations. Um, there's sound examples in that um, in that journey, and um, yeah, it also that particular part of the website actually requires you to go from beginning to end I think it's uh, it is meant as a bit of a journey and uh, also a bit of learning experience because the those po those um, uh, informational posters that we had up there were um, say a lot about sound and and um, different aspects of what we can learn from the sound world yeah mm, that's wonderful yeah, I'm curious, and, and I want to be respectful of your, your time here. So I guess um, a final question is, what uh, is piquing your interest right now? What are you curious about? What particular soundscape is drawing you in? Um, just a little bit about uh, what you're working on presently. Um, well, I mean, the, the COVID experience has been um very interesting i have i speak about it i haven't really done anything about it i've recorded a little bit and and that but i am actually in a stage of my life right now where i'm doing a lot of um reflecting and uh, looking back into my own recordings and my writings and uh, my compositions and working a little bit on putting it in some sort of sensible order that people can access it like with the website for example to um, make that a little bit more accessible and possibly release some of the older pieces that haven't been out there yet or not very much anyways um, I must admit I don't have much um, compositional inspiration right now I there's I'm I'm so stunned by the times as they are that I find myself just basically listening to it and not really knowing what to say about it. And uh, that's an interesting state to be in. Like, I'm not really uh, producing it. I'm very busy with this kind of interviewing or with um, uh, giving classes or some sessions uh, to discuss the issue of listening and so I would say maybe I'm returning a little bit to my <laughs> the activist part of me that uh, you know wants people to learn about this and um, and also I as I continue to learn all the time about uh, listening it is a life task and I'm inspired by that I want to share that and um, that seems to be what keeps me very busy right now and uh, also there are so many books that are coming out about sound um, that I find myself reading a lot um, to see how people are speaking about this, um, how, where the interests lie. And my own writings um, are right now mostly on my website and scattered in different publications. I'm pl toying with the idea of trying to put something together in a book myself, but that hasn't materialized yet. So um, uh, there's so much, uh, the world is so much in question that I must say I'm kind of 
existing like a big huge question mark myself <laughs> right and but that that takes listening and reflecting in its own it's just such an unprecedented time it, you know giving that pause to just experience and and see where your awareness goes is a way of of understanding it right now so yeah no no big ne task needs to be done besides that perhaps yeah. Yes, and you, you, it's good sometimes to really question um, the meaning of it, of, of what you're trying to say mm. uh, and what's more important right now. Is it more important to uh, spend time at home with my grandson who lives with me um, uh, and with the uh, people that I can connect with? Uh, in other words, really be um, connected to the human um human existence right now and how we live under these circumstances and that is very important and that takes its own time and that is very valued time uh, and you know getting to know your neighborhood under these more quieter um, circumstances figuring out the choreography of going out and being at home and and how do you walk uh, with masks on uh, um, among people those all those things take effort and time and mm -hmm. want to be processed somehow and um, that I think is really really important because we will we're learning a lot from that and at the same time uh, there are many people who are very creative in the artistic communities and dealing with the online medium in a new way and there's inspirational stuff that's happening there um, and I'm v it, it's very encouraging to see how creativity is actually spurned by these changes um, so you know I, yeah but I, I can't say that I'm coming up with a lot of new stuff no not really. The world is coming up with yeah. a lot of new stuff. <laughs> yeah, plenty of, plenty of new things, new challenges, yeah. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right, though. I think both what you mentioned about what we've noticed over this last year in the sound environment, you know, when we've had lockdowns and, and quarantines, that aspect of, of hearing more nature, but also all the offerings that people are, are giving online and people are just having to get really innovative and creative with how they're... Um, putting things out there. So I, I think it's really a, a time of development uh, as well. It is. Yeah. Um, yes, yeah. it yeah. is. And, yeah. and it's, you know, the question of survival is very crucial right now. How do we survive this? And how do, what do we do to survive it? And that's when uh, incredible uh, inventions and creativeness uh, surfaces, which is really very encouraging. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Wow. Well, thank you so much. This has been really wonderful. Um, it, what what an adventure of sound that you've had. It's so just great to talk with you. I really appreciate your time and kind of the goal of your, your work to connect people to their surroundings and increase understanding of the importance of protecting the soundscape. So thank you so much. Well, you're very welcome. It's basically sharing what I've experienced all right. my life, really. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for your also interest in this because you've obviously made an effort to um, expose yourself to these ideas. So yeah, yeah, yeah. and hope you know. I I really hope personally, uh, once things clear up, as I, I know they will, um, I'd love to host sound walks here in my little community. Yeah. So um, that would be great. Yeah, yeah, I hope so. I hope so. So, okay. Well, thank you again, and have a beautiful rest of your day. Yeah, the same to you. Thank you. Okay. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for tuning into this episode of Sounds Heal Podcast, sponsored by the Ohm Shop and Spa. You can keep up to date with what's coming up next at soundshealstudio.com. Check things out on Facebook at Sounds Heal Studio. And you can listen to all previous podcasts as well as music meditations on the YouTube channel at Sounds Heal Studio. Be well and stay tuned. <laughs>